Hi, I'm Alan Footman. I'm a sports tour operator from Cape Town. My family and I have been living in the southern suburbs for 21 years. What we love about the neighbourhood is it's very family orientated. Lots of things for the kids to do, uh, especially here where we are next to the farm where folk can walk the dog, go for runs and enjoy the fresh air. In the southern suburbs, we're lucky enough to have some of the top schools in the country. And on top of that, we have the University of Cape Town, one of the most famous universities in the world. Newlands is a great suburb. All the sporting amenities, Newlands rugby ground, cricket ground, etc. Down the road at Claremont, lots of shopping centres for the kids and for the mothers to do their shopping. Fantastic pubs and restaurants around like Forries, Springbok Bar. Bishop's Court is full of beautiful upmarket homes. Kirstenbosch Gardens, National Botanical Gardens right next door. What attracted us to Constantia is, is the large open spaces. I've always wanted to be a farmer and now I'm living next to Kruger Constantia Wine Estate, the oldest wine farm in, in the country where you have fantastic wines, great restaurants, got the best of both worlds. My family and I have loved every moment of living in Constantia. We couldn't be happier, and this is our neighbourhood. Good evening and welcome to episode 30 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantungwa Kumala. We are on day 57 of the national lockdown. I can't believe we actually made it to episode 30. And when we started off, we're just going to be a weekend property podcast. And now we're coming to you daily at seven o'clock, of course, bringing you the latest in all your property matters. And this evening, we're going to be looking at five things that landlords can and cannot do during this lockdown. We've seen a lot of, um, you know, we've received quite a lot of questions from tenants and even landlords asking about some of the things that they can or cannot do. Some tenants are saying, you know, some of their landlords are cutting off water and electricity. They're asking whether they can get evicted. And really to help us unpack what can and cannot be done this evening, we'll be speaking to Bruno Smauer, who's a founding attorney at Bruno Smauer Attorneys. Uh, and before we get there, of course, we are running a live competition right here on private property. And of course, you can always, uh, if you want to enter that competition, all you need to do is download the app, uh, make sure that you take that screenshot, share it down below, and we'll be sure to select the lucky winner who stands, uh, um, who will be winning 1,000 rands. Uh, and of course, we're going to be drawing two lucky winners. So it's not just one person. So your odds really are higher. So of course, if you're tuned in, then do download the app. Make sure to take that screenshot and we'll be announcing the two lucky winners who will be walking away with 1,000 rands just before the end of the show. I'd love to get a thousand rands. I mean, look, I can't enter, uh, but of course, all the best to everybody at home who's going to be entering. We'll be sure to announce that winner before the show ends. But before we get to all the fun stuff, we must of course talk about what we can and cannot do um, during this national lockdown. We are on level four. And of course there are different things that are possible and not possible to help us understand what is what. I'm joined by Bruno Samao. Bruno, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Good evening and thank you for having me. 
So I think maybe let's just start with, I mean, when we saw, uh, you know, going from level five to level four, we also saw that there were different uh, rules that were gazetted in the government gazette around what can and cannot be done just in terms of general movement. So to certain viewers at home who perhaps are not that aware, if you could just, you know, very briefly take us through what is possible, because we know that we're at least able to move, um, unlike in level four, where that wasn't something that was actually possible for us to do. So perhaps explain to our, learners, to our, our viewers at home, rather, you know what we can and cannot do in terms of our movement absolutely all right so uh, maybe just to begin with uh, to, to place it in context level five restricted all movement except for essential workers um, so uh, with the introduction of level four the e certain restrictions allowed certain permitted persons uh, to get back into the swing of things especially to to stimulate the economy um, under the specific regulations that came out um, as soon as level four started at the beginning of may and they did make provision in the regulations under um, regulation 16 subsection 5 to allow a relocation of a person from one area to another be it across uh, districts or provinces whatever the case might be uh, they did allow a relocation to get people back to where they were supposed to be why was that relevant what happened is people anticipate the the, the lockdown is going to last three weeks so uh, I know of clients that decided, oh, I'm going to go on a little holiday now. I'm going to book a place somewhere. We're going to drive through there, and it's going to be an awesome few weeks away from everyone. But when all of a sudden there was an extension, people started realizing, oh, geez, um, what do we do now? And then what started happening, people had to start getting back to work. How did they get back to work? They couldn't. So this easing of movement allowed for a window period for a certain period of time for people to go back to the places where they were residing. Now, there was a lot of confusion with this because it was, oh, go back, but can I enter, can I go to a property where I signed a lease prior to this, but I hadn't moved in yet? What's the situation with that? And there was a lot of confusion. But then a couple of days later, a new, um, a new directive was promulgated in terms of that regulation saying, okay, hold on, guys, right. So you know what? It's okay. We're going to allow a, a greater movement of persons. So we're going to allow... Um, tenants, uh, we're going to allow people to move in in terms of certain lease agreements. But even there, they had a restriction. So a couple of days later, they released another directive, and now they made life easier. So everything, all that context meant nothing at that point, because the reality was now they said, all right, we understand that people need to move around in terms of lease agreements. So this is something we're allowing. So if you enter into a lease right now and you need to move somewhere, it's absolutely allowable. It's not a problem. You're free to move, provided that you have a lease agreement. Now, there's a number of, there are a number, a number of uh, qualifications to this. So it's a provision of a lease or that you've bought a property or that a property has been transferred into your name or domestic violence issues. But for us, as many of us in the property industry, as property owners, we normally look at lease agreements and transfer of ownership. And under these circumstances, now one can uh, enter into a lease and move into a new place of residence if you so wish. So, you know, I actually want to pick up on that last point that you made, because the previous time, um, and this was, of course, before uh, an updated uh, version of the rules had been promulgated, uh, the provision was that you could, um, you could move in the event where you had signed a lease agreement by a certain period. So back then, you essentially couldn't go and look for new tenants and exactly. enter into a new lease agreement. And of course, for that episode, we had had Silna Stein who also made us understand that actually the lease agreements that are essentially in place are those that were entered into before you know the lockdown period and Absolutely. up to a certain point. So essentially, now what you're saying is that in the event where you want to be moving or you want to enter into a new lease agreement, the latest uh, promulgated rules essentially say that we are able to, to do so. Absolutely. So that, uh, so that restriction, uh, it used to be the 30th of April. So there was a yes. lease entered into prior to that point, it's gone. Um, so now you're allowed to, uh, you're allowed to freely um, assign new lease agreements and move into new residences. And, and I mean, I, I remember the previous um, rules, you, we could move until the 7th of June. Um, and I, I think if we now kind of look at the different um, updates that we're getting from, from government, some, some of us certainly in Gauteng are expecting to perhaps go down to level three Great. next week. We're all yes. just crossing our fingers. Mm -hmm. Is there a deadline in terms of when this particular movement or can essentially happen? So is it still movement until the 7th of June or is it essentially between now and if they update otherwise, 
we are free to enter into new lease agreements and move um, into our new places of residence. So it's a level four provision. Um, so everything is done now specifically within level four. Um, the assumption obviously being that when level three kicks in, uh, that it's going to be a lot easier to move around. Um, so, and if level five comes back, then obviously these, um, this ease of movement is going to cease as well. So it's, it's basically level four until we hear otherwise. Okay, that's perfect. Now, of course, we are, uh, if you're watching us at home, taking your questions and comments around whether you're a tenant or a landlord and you essentially confused about what you can or cannot do. As I was saying earlier, you know, we've got so many different questions from viewers at home who are either tenants or landlords wanting to, to, to find out what is possible or what isn't possible. Certain landlords have gone and, you know, whether cut electricity or wanting to end lease agreements. So I really want to get a better understanding of whether or not we are even able to do that, but also understanding that there are still legal parameters with, under which we essentially function. So you can't now kind of act as though, we can't act as though we're in the, in the wild, wild west. So of course, if you do have any questions and comments, do send them through and Bruno will be addressing them. Bruno, we've already got a question in from Antoinette Jube to ask, does my landlord have the right to evict me during this time uh, of this lockdown? Down. I haven't paid rent for two months and uh, no work, no pay. All right. Um, so I suppose to start right at the beginning, um, it's, and this is a perception, this is a perception uh, issue that, that I'm experiencing a lot with the clients. Um, and it's understandable because level five came in and it changed our entire outlook on how to deal with things like this. And everyone suddenly started working on assumptions that nothing is normal anymore and started exploring what is. And what I'm telling my clients now and colleagues and everyone else is we need to take a step back and we need to change this assumption, and this perception. And instead of looking at the negative and trying to figure out what is still around, we need to go back to the way that we were in our mindset prior to lockdown and then try and figure out what still cannot be done. And that's a lot easier because there's a lot, there's a lot more things that have now stayed the same under level four and that we can now work under level four as opposed to uh, doing it the other way around and trying to move backwards. So what is the position before level four? If, if a person's staying in your property, for example, especially in terms of uh, residential leases, uh, commercial leases are slightly different. Uh, so in terms of residential leases, they are liable for rent. Why? Because they're enjoying occupation of the property. This is, uh, this is a known fact. It's, we've, it's been around the news. We've said it a million times. Unfortunately, rent is payable. So, so what are the, uh, the remedies for a landlord uh, in a situation where rent is not paid? they're the same as they were before lockdown. So if rent isn't paid, the tenant will be in breach of the agreement. By being in breach of the agreement, the landlord can make an election on whether to cancel the agreement, uh, indulge the late payment, whatever the case is. So legally speaking, the landlord can enforce the payment of rent. If, uh, if he tries to enforce the payment of rent and for some reason the tenant still doesn't pay, he can cancel the lease agreement. So obviously he has to give proper notice he needs to cancel the lease agreement and he can proceed to go to court. Now, obviously, amongst these, there are certain difficulties. Like, for example, delivering a letter of demand might be made slightly difficult because now you can't just travel um, and drive around whenever you want. So you'd have to work slightly harder to deliver, but you can deliver and it will count. Uh, summons, very similar. And the courts are a bit slow in process. But can you deliver a summons? Yes, you can. It just takes a bit of extra effort to get the summons from court to the tenant's place of residence. Um, eviction proceedings, very similar. Um, if you can institute them, if you can get them served, you can proceed with them. However, with eviction proceedings, there is one but. And this but is, in terms of Regulation 19, um, it's made very clear that we can proceed with evictions. However, the execution of these eviction orders are going to be stayed and suspended until, um, until, uh, until stated otherwise. So until level four is done with. And so what that means is if you have a court order in front of you, you can get a court order. The court order can say that an eviction is allowed. However, by, when you hand it to the sheriff, the sheriff will tell you, unfortunately, we cannot do anything about this right now. So the enforcement is unfortunately hampered there but the, the actual obtaining of a court order is allowed. So this is from the landlord side of things. So to answer uh, your viewer's question, now from the tenant side of things, a tenant can be evicted. However, they can't actually be removed from the property. 
right? Uh, it's not allowed under it's not allowed under the rule uh, under the regulations. What I see with tenants especially is we all in a situation now where we need to start working with each other. It's unprecedented times. We need to start negotiating. So I have seen more often than not, landlords will, will grant indulgences because no one wants to go to court. No one wants to do eviction applications, especially when there's no value in doing an eviction application if you can't at this moment evict someone. So you'd only do it in exceptional circumstances where the tenant is being extremely difficult. So mm -hmm. can you evict someone? You can get an order. Um, would you want to evict someone? That's a different question. And I think there you'd need to negotiate with the tenant and actually be able to come up with some sort of resolution on how to best deal with this. And Bruno, we've got another question here from our viewers at home. Uh, this one is coming in from Desiree Ranoko, who asks, uh, once deferred payment has been agreed upon and the tenant defaults, what is my recourse as the landlord? Look, it's very similar to the normal principles of contract law. So, and not, again, nothing would differ. So we can take COVID out of this. There was a deferment agreement. The deferment took one month's rent or two months' rent and split it over a period of time. So first of all, one needs to look at the wording of the deferment agreement. So most of the agreements would be drafted so that you take one month and let's say you split it up over the next two after that. So a rental of 6,000, for example, would be 3,000 the following month and 3,000 after that. Many of these agreements would require that the first payment be made, failing which the full amount becomes due. So uh, it would be the 3,000, but if you fail to pay that first 3,000, you'd have to now make up the 6,000. And in terms of that agreement, it's due. And that being due will allow someone to actually go to court and enforce it and collect it um, in terms of legal proceedings. Again, is that ideal? It is, depending on the tenant, uh, the relationship with the tenant that you have. Um, is the tenant still paying his rent? He just failed to pay the arrear rent. That's also a very important question because that could also lead to a situation where you might want to negotiate and allow further deferment, provided that he's paying his current rent and it's simply the past rent that he maybe needed a bit of an indulgence on. Of course, I am on the line with Bruno Smile, who's the founding attorney at Bruno Smile Attorneys. And we're looking at the five things landlords can and cannot do during this lockdown, especially during level four restrictions. If you're watching us at home and you've got any questions, whether you're a tenant or a landlord, and you're still a bit uncertain about what can or cannot be done, please do send through those questions, of course, on Fridays, we have that Q&A, Ask Private Property, where we bring in experts to help us understand a particular issue better. We're going to go for a quick break. And after the break, we're going to be taking more of your questions. Of course, if you are watching, you still have time to enter that competition. If you want to stand a chance of winning 1,000 rands, we'll be giving away two, um, you know, 1,000 rands. So two lucky winners are going to be winning at the end of the show. All you have to do is follow the prompts that we've posted just below. And that is, of course, downloading the app, taking a screenshot and sharing and tagging your friends and then we'll be able to announce those two lucky winners at the end of the show for more of your questions and comments we'll be answering them just after this break
Welcome back to episode 30 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantungwa Kumalo. It's a Friday, so of course we are asking private property. And the topic this evening is the five things landlords can and cannot do during this lockdown. Of course, we're looking at level four restrictions and what is possible and not possible for us. And to help us better understand what we can and cannot do, I'm joined by Bruno Simao, who is the founding attorney of Bruno Simao Attorneys. And Bruno, you know, before the, the, the break, I did say that we'll be taking more questions and comments from our viewers at home and then one of the questions that we've certainly been receiving quite a bit is around um you know utilities and whether landlords can simply cut water and electricity because they are now you know we're on day 57 and some of their tenants have been defaulting now it's the second if not the third month that they're defaulting and some of them are getting desperate they think you know if i cut utilities right now then perhaps my tenant would move out and that would give me an opportunity to get in a new tenant can landlords actually do that So the answer to this question is no, and it's been no even long before lockdown took place. So again, we're going back to prior to lockdown. That situation hasn't changed as yet. A landlord is not allowed to cut off uh, water and electricity unless it's by a court order. And that's very important. So it's not to say that you cannot do something. It's to say that you cannot take the law into your own hands and do it without asking a court's permission. Um, that's most of the time that's why landlords actually install prepaid meters on properties in order to be able to regulate this better Um, but in situations where there is no prepaid meter the only way to enforce some sort of um, um, switch off of power is um, to go to court and ask the court for a court order allowing you to do so I do know obviously of situations where if a landlord does let a property to a tenant uh, that happens to be directly linked to the municipality there are situations where the municipality may may uh, switch off the power where it's not really in the landlord's hands um, although I, I haven't seen many situations now recently where the municipality is switching off power because i think they are mindful of the fact that there is a lockdown so they're playing their part in making sure there aren't any disconnections but i may be wrong obviously i can't speak for the entire country but insofar as the landlord is concerned he cannot do it without a court order but will he be able to obtain a court order in the current in the current circumstances it's a little bit difficult because we've been asking this question quite a bit and again i haven't seen many examples of it uh, i have um, there is an application that a body corporate is making at this moment to switch off power to an owner that's not paying levies and we are confident that in these circumstances it will be granted because these utility charges keep accumulating quite drastically uh, whether a landlord would be able to achieve the same result right now it's possible there's nothing necessary that says you cannot but this would be in the hands of the court and i am finding naturally that the courts are being very um very cautious and they're being very um or sympathetic to the needs of the tenants which is understandable mm-hmm. um, so obtaining those orders might might not be that easy and I think, you know, one of the things that we certainly have to be mindful of, of course, is we don't know how long this is going to last, right? So I think cutting off utilities, um, it, it may just happen that that tenant may not be able to secure alternative accommodation. Exactly. So I can understand even why the court would probably be particularly lenient, because trying to find alternative accommodation, given the, you know, the, the, the environment that we find ourselves in right now, is going to be quite tricky. We could very well be in this position until the end of the year. So, and it's a bit of that, you know, cash to you two situation, because on the one hand, you certainly understand where the landlord is coming from because he's thinking, well, the, the tenant is staying there and their electricity and water bill is going higher and higher. They're already not paying their rental and they're also not able to cover the utilities. But in the same breath, They've been affected by this, uh, you know, pandemic, whether they've, you know, lost their income completely or partially, because, of course, we've seen those mass retrenchments in different sectors across the country. I was going to comment here coming in from uh, one of our viewers at home, uh, you know, on this issue of evictions and essentially the cash 22 situation that a lot of tenants and landlords find themselves in. This one is coming in from Marupe Ne Josephine, who says a tenant can be evicted when there is no payment during a certain period of time the landlord has a right to do whatever they want since there is no money coming in remember bills have to be paid of course that that isn't completely true because i think there's still the legal ambits under which the 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 landlord has to essentially operate by isn't that And, and this is such a difficult conversation to have and i think you hit the nail perfectly on the head with this 
Um, I obviously, as an attorney, I've got a lot of clients that are landlords. So most of my conversations are towards landlords. And that's not to say that I'm not sympathetic to the plight of a tenant. Um, but it is just difficult because if you look at it legally within the confines of our law, the reality is the tenant is liable. Um, and there's no real two ways about it. Unless there's an engagement and a negotiation, um, the tenant is liable. Commercial leases, like I mentioned, are slightly different because of the concepts like force majeure and whether um, actual trading is still taking place. But that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. If you're enjoying occupation, you're living in somebody's residence, the reality behind it is you're enjoying it, but they're not receiving any benefit from your enjoyment. There's a level of enrichment here. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's a breach of contract. And I suppose that's the downside. It's not to say that I'm, I'm it's, uh, you know, speaking against the tenants, but the reality is within the confines, um, the landlord does have a right to collect rent. And your viewer was correct in saying, look, we are entitled, but it has to be within the ambit of the law. And from a tenant's perspective, the reality is you do need to engage. If there is a retrenchment, we, we all do need to work together, approach the landlord, speak to them. Don't just refuse to pay because that, that unfortunately is lighting the fire and, mm. um, and igniting and antagonizing the landlord to the point where that relationship is very quickly going to deteriorate. Um, that engagement is very important, but that's all I can really say for the benefit of the tenant at this moment. We've got a slightly different question. This one coming in from Jarel Jafta who asks, can repairs be done during lockdown, especially when you rent? There's some issues in the place and the landlord is, is not keeping his end of the bargain, but I'm still paying rent. So, um, so the reality with this is it depends. So there is nothing specific in the regulations that define um, necessarily what repairs can and can't be done. But uh, we are looking at, I, so I know, for example, if you look at plumbing and um, the supply of electricity, those have always been allowed because they are considered to be essential. Um, they, they, they're essential to just the general day-to-day -day living. So that, those have always been allowed. But for example, cosmetic changes, those don't fall under the regulation. So if you look, for example, at where the construction is allowed under the regulations, they say only essential construction would be allowed. A certain infrastructure, obviously, around the mining sector, but not just general tiling or painting. So it, it really depends on the nature of the, the, the work that needs to be done or the damage or condition of the property. If your, um, if your uh, plumbing isn't working, yes. You can call a plumber. The landlord is obliged to call a plumber on behalf of the tenant, needs to get sorted out. If it's electricity supply, uh, like for example, just actual electric installations, absolutely. Security, absolutely. If, if you get broken into and the burglar bars get ripped off the wall, you can get somebody in. If the sensors aren't working, great, you can get somebody in. If you've got a cracked tile, sorry, it's, that's not really what the purpose of the regulation is. So that you'd have to hold back on and just wait. A uh, comment coming in from Stephanie Whitboy who says, very tough for both parties. I believe communication is key. So both parties are understood and a way forward is decided. And of course, it's, you know, something that we've been emphasizing, you know, throughout these conversations. The very first episode that we did right here on the Private Property Podcast was between Zekemieza and uh, Gil Sperling, who were looking at the types of conversations that certainly landlords and tenants should be having, because we could already foresee that there was going to be tension, that there was going to be quite a lot of um, you know question marks from both parties and that will potentially I mean at the time we thought we were going to be in this for 21 days we we're yeah. already seeing certain re uh, companies retrenching we certainly mm -hmm. didn't think that we'd be here 57 days later and the, the the retrenchment would be you know at such a large scale and so many people's jobs would be affected so from as early on as back then we're saying open communication is so crucial and being able to attempt to meet other meet each other halfway is also such a crucial thing but then Bruno, of course in the event where that is not possible because i think we we've been speaking a lot of best case scenarios and really appealing to uh people's humanity and saying look mm. we really are all in this together um this this is one of those things that is in many ways becoming a bit of an equalizer mm. uh, a lot of us all of us are stuck at home for the most part um, and there's, of course, some people are essential service workers and they're able to go home. And even they're essentially affected because even companies are, you know, decreasing people's um, salary. But in the event where landlords um, are finding themselves with, let's say, tenants who are not paying on time, or even better, a tenant who is paying on time, but landlords are also not providing the necessary services, 
what can each party essentially do? And I want to us to focus a little bit first on what a tenant can do in the event where the landlord isn't being responsive. So suppose you're trying to communicate that you're being retrenched or your finances are being affected and they're simply not responding. Um, you know, what can they do in situations like that? Absolutely. Okay, so from look, from a tenant side, it's slightly difficult. And I, I suppose we have to break that question up into two. So um, if a landlord is failing to fulfill his obligations, uh, the, obviously uh, the tenant has rights in terms of those circumstances. So again, the examples that we gave were is security breaches, electrical installations, plumbing. Um, in situations like that, forget COVID, the same rules apply. And a tenant can force the landlord to resolve it or take action, uh, take action in order to remedy it. And action, for example, many leases do would allow a situation where if it is urgent that a tenant can resolve the issue themselves and can then claim this from, from the landlord. So the cost of repairs that the landlord refuses to undertake, a tenant can go and try and collect this from, from the landlord. So that is certainly possible and a right that the tenant has. Uh, insofar as communication, um, you know, pursuant to retrenchment is concerned, unfortunately, in those instances, again, our law doesn't cover a situation of hardship. So as a tenant, despite the fact that you might be in a very hard situation, not be able to pay the rent, the lease agreement still has to be complied with unless it specifically allows for some sort of indulgence in those circumstances, which I can promise you 99.9% .9 of leases wouldn't. So in those situations, I'm sorry to say, but if you try to communicate with the landlord and the landlord isn't engaging with you, it is it is a very difficult situation. But in turn, on, on paper, the tenant doesn't have any rights in that respect. But again, now there's a but to that. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Do continue, Bruno. So there's a but to that, and this is something that uh, my colleague Sil uh, Silma Spain. We've had quite a few conversations about this, and it's the concept of Ubuntu, right? And in our law. The fact that, um, that this principle should actually be um, woven into the way that we draft our contracts, the way that we read our legislation. And in a situation like this, one would expect that right to come to the fore and people to almost be forced to engage in order to assist others within reason. So it is very interesting. Unfortunately, there's not enough case law to kind of support an opinion on whether this is going to be an enforceable right. But there is a school of thought to say, well, the landlord at least has an obligation to engage, to consider, uh, mm. to put his, his story out there and explain why he cannot afford to, to give a remission of rent or to discount rent or to defer rent because of his circumstances. And let's face it, a lot of landlords are sometimes getting uh, payment plans from the bank. So there might be opportunity for some landlords to be able to do that. Not all, as some of them rely on income. So depending on the circumstances, this concept of Ubuntu could really come in and play a role. Uh, but at the moment, it's still a very kind of vague concept. And focusing on the letter of the law, unfortunately, there is nothing that really forces a landlord to engage. The last question, Bruno, for this evening is coming in from Corey Ann Lee Sidris, who asks, can landlords increase their rent during this time um, if, if in any other time they wouldn't have? Um, so, so the latter part of that question is difficult to decipher. It's, um, so if, if we just look back again and we forget COVID, the reality is there's a contract that's in place. And if the contract provides for escalation clause, then in terms of the contract, one would be allowed to, to increase the rent. It's, it's quite as simple as that. Um, if a person wouldn't be entitled to do it under other times or other circumstances, then it's, it's doubtful that they would be able to do it now because the contract wouldn't provide for it. Um, if, for example, it's a month-to-month -month contract and the landlord tries to increase it now, all of a sudden, he can do it because he, all he has to do is give you the 30 days notice and you're allowed to vacate and enter into another lease if you, if you, if you want to. So I suppose he can do it. So to answer the can he, yes. Should he or is it wise to? I mean, aside from the fact that we're trying to work together to achieve certain results here, the reality is the market isn't that great. Um, mm. So increasing rent now makes no sense on a commercial perspective. Um, it, it's highly doubtful you're going to be able to get tenants who aren't struggling. Everyone's struggling. If at all, you should probably be considering decreasing the rent, not increasing it. But again, supply and demand. So that would really depend on, on that would depend on the landlord. 
Bruno, we're going to leave it there this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, there was Bruno Samal, who is the founding attorney at Bruno Samal and Attorneys. And of course, we're looking at the five things landlords can and cannot do during this lockdown, uh, particularly within the level four restrictions. I think the really big thing um, that even Bruno has been emphasizing and that of course we have been emphasizing throughout uh, the different episodes is that we have to attempt to find ways to meet each other halfway. I think we're all struggling in, in, you know, in different ways as homeowners, as landlords, but equally our tenants are also you know, going through a very uh, difficult time financially and otherwise. So we almost need to find different ways uh, as both parties to meet each other halfway and really try to find a solution so that post COVID we're able to, to still maybe, you know, your tenant in the event where their lease is still in place, they're able to stay there. And I think we've been, you know, even talking about the cost of even getting a new tenant um, and just how high that is. So really you want to take care of the tenants, particularly the good tenants that you've had as much as possible. Bruno, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. And of course, I did promise that we are going to be ha announcing the winners of that private property competition. So if you've been downloading, the, if you downloaded the app and you've been sharing uh, those screenshots of the, the app, then you might be the lucky winner. And I think we're now going to start with the lucky draw. Uh, the first winner of the competition is, and I think my colleague is going to, to do the draw that's also going to be on your screen shortly. Giving away money seems so interesting, especially on a Friday evening. I mean, you're going to be a thousand rand richer. And the winner is Butali Ramoluro. Uh, uh, Butali, congratulations. You are a happy winner of 1,000 rands that is going to be coming your way. And of course, now for the second winner who's going to be walking away with that 1,000 rand prize. I wish I could get a thousand rands. I mean, it's a random, uh, it's a month end. Friday and you're going to be walking away with an extra thousand rands. Must be so nice. I think I, I need to find ways to be able to enter this competition. And the second winner is uh, Salty and Tombe, you know, who walks away, of course, with that 1,000 rand prize. Uh, congratulations to both winners. Uh, a part of me wants to slide into your DMs just so you, you know, give me a little bit of that money. <laughs> but of course, we're going to continue running these competitions. Uh, so do stay tuned to the private property page right here on Facebook. And of course, you can continue entering. Make sure to take those screenshots, tag your friends, and you might stand a chance of winning that 1,000 Rand cash price. I know that an amount like that certainly can go a long way in these trying times. That's it for us this week. It's been a really great rendition of the private property podcast. We're going to be back again on Monday looking at different issues that have to do with property. Of course, if you have any topics that you'd like us to you know, tackle, any experts that you want us to talk to, do send in those suggestions and we'll be more than happy to get them in and answer some of your pressing questions. Until next week, stay staying at home and staying safe. We'll be back on Monday. Hi, I'm Brandon Ribbing. I'm an entrepreneur from Durban. The suburbs of Berea and Morningside are built on a natural ridge that overlooks the home of the... Uh, this has got an incredible outlook elevated over the city. Living in Morningside. Hi, I'm Brandon Ribbing. I'm an entrepreneur from Durban. The suburbs of Berea and Morningside are built on a natural ridge that overlooks the home of the Sharks, the Moses Mabida Stadium, uh, Durban Country Club, it's just got an incredible outlook elevated over the city. Living in Morningside makes so much sense to us because everything is so central. Anything that we choose to do is a couple of kilometers away or a couple of hundred meters away. Restaurants, coffee shops, it's all here on our doorstep. You know, we've got uh, 
great schools here. Uh, the girls' schools just close by are Maristella and Durban Girls College, and then fantastic boys' schools, uh, Durban Preparatory High School, DPHS, one of the top primary schools in the country, and then Clifton, which now goes all the way to high school. It's so convenient to be in this area where everything is close by. Some of our closest friends stay just across the Amgani River in Durban North. Durban North is very family orientated with some great schools, some excellent restaurants and some small commercial centres. The promenade along Durban's beachfront, also known as the Golden Mile, got an incredible facelift for the 2010 World Cup and today is used by all of Durban's population. We as a family love the Durban beachfront. If we're not in the water, you'll find us on our bicycles along the promenade. Being a world paddleboard champion, I've traveled to some of the most amazing beaches around the world, but nothing comes close to what we have here in Durban. Durban has great weather and great conditions all year round for surfing and for training and just being in the ocean. And that's why it's known as the warmest place to be. We've lived here our whole lives and there's no place we'd rather be and this is our neighborhood.